what you could call a 2024 win for Donald Trump, with more maybe right around the corner. First, that decision coming down from the Supreme Court to keep the former president on the ballot in all 50 states. Why the justices made that call and what it means for Mr. Trump's White House push. Then we are just hours now from the first poll openings in 15 states for Super Tuesday. Our team's out on the trail covering every bit of it and what could be Nikki Haley's last stand. Everything you ever wanted to know about Super Tuesday just ahead. Plus, across the country, we're on the ground as people try to recover from absolutely bananas weather. California digging out after getting hit with 10 feet of snow in some parts. But in Texas, firefighters are struggling to contain the worst wildfire in that state's history. We're live in both spots. And a surprise move, Beijing getting rid of a decades-old tradition. Why the government in China is dropping one of the only opportunities for journalists to question top Chinese leaders. Then, two of the biggest names in the worlds of sports and music taking a big swing. The new reporting that LeBron James and Drake are betting big on golf's PGA Tour. That's coming up a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, former President Trump says it is a big day for liberty after the Supreme Court handed him what's essentially a win for his 2024 campaign. Listen. Essentially, you cannot take somebody out of a race because an opponent would like to have it that way. While most uh, states were thrilled to have me, there were some that didn't, and they didn't want that for political reasons. The Supreme Court ruling unanimously the former president should stay on Colorado's primary ballot, a decision that could have thrown the presidential race into chaos if things had gone the other way, right? Remember the question here, okay? It's centered on whether the former president intentionally organized and incited a violent mob on January 6th. Six Coloradans who sued argued yes. Now, the justices did not make a decision on that piece of it. They didn't make a decision on whether or not that's true. But they all agree that individual states shouldn't be able to just kick candidates for federal office off their ballots under this section of the 14th Amendment that bans insurrectionists from holding office. You see this section of the Constitution at question here. The justices essentially said it'll be a hot mess if candidates were to get taken off the ballot in some states but not others. The reason this ruling is so significant is not just because of what it means for Colorado, where Mr. Trump will stay on the ballot, but also for what it means for him in Maine and Illinois, too, where similar cases have come up. And the timing, that is key. Colorado is one of the Super Tuesday states that votes tomorrow. So is Maine, by the way. We'll talk about what we can expect in those places and beyond with Garrett Hake and Ali Vitale, our campaign correspondents covering all things politics. But I want to start with our Ken Delanian, who's back home in Washington. And Ken... A lot of people were looking to the Supreme Court to see which way the justices would go here. If you were reading the tea leaves, and I know you were before today, it seemed like this was the direction they were leaning. It is a critical decision for the Supreme Court, maybe their most important since back in Bush v. Gore. Uh, and there's, there's more to come here, too, from the Supreme Court. Talk us through it. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. You use the term chaos in your opening. The justices use that term as well. They painted a picture of a situation with states knocking federal candidates off the presidential ballot at different times for different reasons. They said that would be a mess, and they said the con nothing in the Constitution requires us to endure that chaos. Uh, and so they, they, they unanimously decided that, in fact, states don't have the power under the 14th Amendment to, to do this, That and, and they went further and said that, only an act of Congress could enforce this provision in the 14th Amendment. Obviously, one thing they didn't do, Hallie, is they didn't take a position on whether Donald Trump actually engaged in insurrection. Uh, and obviously, the Colorado courts ruled that he did. And we have some reaction from the Colorado Secretary of State, who's not happy. My larger reaction is disappointment. I do believe that states should be able under our Constitution to bar oath-breaking insurrectionists. And ultimately, this decision leads open or leaves open the door for Congress to act to pass authorizing legislation. And there are such bills uh, that have been introduced, Hallie, but nobody thinks they have a prayer of passing. We mentioned, Ken, that this is a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court. We don't see a whole ton of those at a moment this high profile, but it wasn't necessarily unanimous thinking on the part of all nine justices. Explain that piece of it. Absolutely right. The three liberals joined by Amy Coney Barrett dissented on the question of 
is it only an act of Congress that must enforce this provision? They said that that went too far and precluded other uh, ways to enforce it, for example, a, ju a judge's ruling at the federal level, or, or if uh, a candidate was convicted of the crime of insurrection, which uh, says it bars uh, that person from holding office. So. They, and, and they suggested, or at least the liberals did, that the, the majority was doing this in part to help Donald Trump and to preclude further uh, future problems on the insurrectionist front. It was a little bit of a shot uh, at, at the majority. But the majority rules here, and they've decided that only an act of Congress can enforce this 14th Amendment provision. Ken Delaney and live for us back home in Washington. Ken, thanks. Let me bring in Garrett Hake now, who is live on what I, I think you can call the campaign trail, effectively, Garrett, in West Palm Beach, Florida, near the former president's home. Uh, and it's interesting, was having a conversation today about the legal issues that the former president faces. This was one of them. It is now a win, right, per the Supreme Court justices for the former president in Colorado, in some of these other states, too. Uh, we have seen in these primaries those kinds of legal issues actually move Republicans toward former President Trump, right? Yeah, that's exactly right, Hallie. I mean, really, these legal cases across the spectrum, from the civil cases to the criminal to this more administrative question before the Supreme Court today, have been rocket fuel for Donald Trump's campaign. And that really undercut the theory of the case for so many of the Republicans who ran against him in this primary, who thought that these cases would somehow show that he was weaker, that he was less likely to defeat President Biden. Donald Trump, in his way, has sort of twisted that into the total other direction, suggesting that all of these cases are part of some massive conspiracy to knock him off the ballot or to somehow get rid of the strongest challenger to Joe Biden. And Republican primary voters agree. They have been with him uh, every step of the way. I've talked to I don't know how many Republican voters who say they think Donald Trump is under attack and it's up to them to defend the former president. So to the degree he talks about the weaponization of government, I would say he has quite effectively weaponized these cases mm. against him as a talking point in his favor. It has worked very well for him in a Republican primary as we shift to a more general election audience, independent voters, voters who've been paying less attention up until now. That could very well change in the summer and fall, but that's a battle for another day. Hold that general election thought for just a second, Garrett. I want to come back to that, but first I want to hit on this interesting moment here where the former president was clearly trying to take advantage of what you could call a messaging moment, right? After the Supreme Court decision came down saying, hey, bring in the cameras, like I want to talk about it. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, as you pointed out, we are not exactly on the campaign trail. It is striking that a day before Super Tuesday, the Republican frontrunner isn't doing anything like traditional campaigning. We're not out in any of these battleground states. We're here in Florida, but he knew with the Supreme Court acting today, he could summon the cameras in, get quite a lot of attention, where he made much the same case that he does on the campaign trail. I mean, he really only talked about the Colorado case for just a brief moment at the top of his remarks. And then he sort of worked the refs a little bit, talking mm -hmm. about the more more important in his view case the Supreme Court has coming up, this question of whether he will have immunity from other prosecution. Listen to what he had to say about that. If a president doesn't have full immunity, you really don't have a president. A president has to be free. A president has to be if the president does a good job. I did. Obviously, these legal cases are not a question of whether or not Donald Trump did a good job or not. But the immunity question is so central to what his summer and fall in the whole countries will look like. Obviously, he's trying to make this about something bigger than himself. Yeah. But that Supreme Court decision on whether or not he's immune from prosecution could have a huge, I mean, huge impact on who's the next president of the United States. Garrett Haig, live for us in West Palm, down in South Florida, near the former president's home. Garrett, thank you. Let me bring in Ali Vitale now, who's in one of those Super Tuesday states we talked about, the state of Texas. Uh, not only, Ali, does our friend and colleague Garrett Haig know that state well, he also talked about the idea that the former president is looking to shift to look towards the general election, right, now that we're approaching Super Tuesday. The candidate you cover, Nikki Haley, is going, well, wait a second, time out. We are not there yet. We are still in primary land with tomorrow night, it is really hard to overstate the stakes for her. It really is make or break. A political cliche, but in this instance, it's cliche because it's true. Exactly. It has the benefit of being true here because Nikki Haley is the person 
standing in the way of Donald Trump effectively coordinating himself and saying, hey, I won this thing. Let's actually move into a general election posture. And it's one thing for us to say, oh, it's an uphill climb for Nikki Haley because of the polling. And that's true. But it's also another thing to say it because of the graphic that I'm going to put up on the screen. I'm going to look at it here. You look at, look at it over there <laughs> on the screen. Because if you look at the way that the rules are working in these states, it's not just a question of, oh, the polling is in Trump's favor. It's the threshold that you need to hit to actually get delegates, which is actually how you become the nominee of the Republican Party. You look at a state, for example, like Texas, where I am. This is one where you've got to get more than 50 percent. You take all the delegates. You look at another state, for example, like Min is, I think that's Minnesota up at the top over there, another state that Haley went to. There you have to hit the even higher threshold of 80 percent to get all the delegates. It is unlikely, though we'll see if someone's able to hit 80 percent. That's someone likely being Donald Trump. But that's why the delegate math is so hard for Nikki Haley. There are states on this map, like Virginia or Maine, for example, where Haley has spent time and where they feel like the rules on the ground of who's able to vote in these primaries mean that it's probably more fertile ground for her to get a higher percentage of the vote. Fine, but we're not just playing a game of get a good percentage. We're playing a game of you have to hit a certain threshold to actually take home delegates there. And what's also interesting is the way that Nikki Haley, if in fact this campaign, this primary campaign is closing in on its end, right? If Donald Trump, he won't get the yeah. magic number of delegates that he needs tomorrow night, he could get it by the middle of March, right? So if that is the case, the question then becomes not just, you know, what does Nikki Haley do, but who does she potentially back? in this general election, right? Because she told our friend and colleague, Kristen Welker, over on Meet the Press, that she's not bound yeah. by that promise, that pledge to the RNC to support the Republican presidential nominee. Tricky little thing when these candidates remember that it's just a piece of paper. There is no legal binding to signing a pledge with the RNC that says, yeah, I'm going to support the Republican nominee. Obviously, all of them signed that to get on the debate stage. Nikki Haley telling Kristen Welker over the weekend, yeah, I know I signed that to get on the debate stage, but it was a different RNC then, not the one that Trump is trying to remake in his image now. That's in part why she's leaving the door open to both not endorsing him or endorsing him. Mm. All of that, though, puts the cart before the horse when it comes to Haley has to actually get out of the race first before she's actually able to endorse anyone. And we're not there yet because the campaign is not there yet. The candidate is saying in vague terms that they're going to stay in this race until they stop being competitive. Now, depends on who deems her competitive. But as long as she sees that there are people who want an alternative, it's clear Haley is going to keep running out that clock. Maybe that ends on Wednesday. Maybe that ends the week after. But as long as Trump hasn't locked up this nomination yet, Haley could keep going. Ali Vitali, And if she does, you will be right there covering every step of the way. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. We will see you tomorrow <laughs> night along with the rest of our team here for our special Super Tuesday coverage. It starts actually exactly 24 hours from now, minus 12 minutes, however you're watching now. Tomorrow night, 5 o'clock Eastern, five full hours of Super Tuesday coverage with myself, my colleague Tom Yamas. All the folks you see on screen right there rolling into NBC News at 10 o'clock Eastern. Do not miss it. Big day in politics and beyond. Got to take you to some big moments now out west because right now you've got millions of people digging themselves out after a blockbuster snowstorm slammed parts of the west. Listen, when we say blockbuster, we mean it. Ten feet of snow in some spots, if you can believe it. The wind in some of these places stronger than a Cat 5 hurricane, more than 190 miles an hour. The storm buried homes and cars, shut down 100 miles of a big highway, and now there's another monster storm on the way. Steve Patterson has been in the thick of it in California. S snowblowers have ceased to function, right, because they can only do so much. You're just starting to see some of the critical highways opening back up. Talk us through what you're seeing and where this goes. We're seeing snow again, Hallie. I was so looking forward to talking to you with some sunlight. It happened for maybe about six hours today. It's the first my producer and my crew had seen in 72 hours where it wasn't snowing. And we've got flurries again because a new system is moving in. Thankfully, you can see something. You may be able to see the ground behind me. That wasn't possible less than about 24 hours ago. There has been a lull in this. There is. There are essentially two systems. The storm which is moving out and a new system which is moving in. I say new system because it is nowhere near what we saw over this weekend. This was continuous storms, continuous snow since Thursday night, essentially. It shut down 
I-80, which is, if you know anything about this area, it is the major thoroughfare. It is the lifeblood of the mountain region of California. That shutting down meant, essentially, that people that would have to go three miles to go somewhere had to go 10 miles, essentially, around the entirety of Lake Tahoe. And while that's happening, it's just continuously snowing sheets. We're talking eight feet in some places, eight to 10 feet in other places, 10 to 12 feet if you go high enough. And when you're up that high, that's when you're talking about those 190 mile an hour wind gusts. This storm was ridiculous, but it was more ridiculous in that it was so relentless. It wasn't just the wind speed, it's just that it would not stop. Uh, and so finally it has, and now residents giving themselves a breather, but again, not before more flurries move in as they are right now. But that Allie? can be just a gut punch, right, for folks who are trying to dig out from this storm, knowing that there is just more on the way. More on the way, but look, this is trucky California. Uh, you, people yeah. are used to snow. Yeah, snow, feet. snow is the lifeblood of this place. Ten feet, no, yeah, and that caught a lot of people off guard. Certainly, there were people I spoke to that said, "Yeah, you guys in the media, you hype it up all the time." And Snowmageddon really did come. They were shocked. Uh, we spoke to people as they were kind of digging out their businesses, awaiting the next snow. Listen to this. Well, we've been trying to keep up with it throughout the storm, but as you can see, it only takes a couple hours before you have everything that you've done completely covered up again. The whole snowmageddon is coming, and we were like, ah, it's snow, we've got this. And then snowmageddon. <laughs> That's the woman, Snowmageddon, and it really was. Again, another system, maybe one to two feet in the mountains, just inches, though, where I'm standing. Not a big deal for people in Truckee, but nobody wants to see more snow right now, I guarantee you. I Allie. bet, and not least of which, you and your, and your crew, Steve, I'm sure, live for us there in Truckee. Thank you. Let's take you to Texas, because also happening now, millions under wildfire alerts as firefighters struggle to contain one of the biggest fires in that state's history fueled by really intense winds. It's so bad that the governor of California is sending their National Guard to help fight this thing. Look at this, more than a million acres already burned. You can see tons of smoke, people trying to do what they can, these rescue crews. Morgan Chesky is live for us now in Texas. It's, it can be hard, I think, for people to wrap their heads around the sheer scope, the size of this thing. Morgan, talk us through it. Yeah, incredibly well said, Hallie. You can literally get on a highway here in Fritch, Texas, and drive for two hours to Canadian, Texas. And the majority of that drive, you will see charred landscapes. That is what a burn area looks like when it consumes more than a million acres, which is what this Smokehouse Creek fire has done. One of just five named fires here in the Texas Panhandle. And let's look at it by the numbers, though. More than a million acres burned. We have more than 500 buildings that have authorities say have been lost as a result of these fast-moving flames. And unfortunately, the most tragic number of all here, Hallie, two lives have been lost from this fire that started a week ago today. And pretty much every single day since then, a new portion of the Texas panhandle has burned. It's certainly leaving everyone feeling that they're not even out of the woods. Even though the winds have died down, there is so much fuel around here that can burn that has officials saying this. Take a listen. It's inevitable that we're going to get another start. You believe that? It, whether it's a power line, somebody dragging chains, a truck backfiring something over into the growth, just, anything. Just one spark. Just one spark. And speaking of power lines, one woman who lives in Canadian Texas and lost her home is now uh, pursuing a lawsuit against a utility provider, Excel Energy. In this lawsuit, Hallie, she's saying that because they failed to maintain a power pole, it fell down, snapping at its base, putting those power lines close to that dry grass. And the lawsuit alleges that is what caused this fire. The fire chief of a neighboring community says his team did observe at least one power pole down uh, wow. right around the time this fire fire began. In the meantime, there was an entirely different fire that played out last night, not too far from where we are uh, in neighboring Sanford. That small community had to be evacuated. Hallie, this town had to be evacuated for the third time from a wildfire in less than a week. Wow. The stress of that, even when they go back home and their home is fine, the sheer recurrence is weighing very heavily on everyone here. It's just Allie? disruptive, to say the least. Morgan Chesky, right in the thick of it there in Texas. Morgan, thank you so much for that.
Let me bring in meteorologist Bill Karens now. Okay, Bill, so there's all this happening, and yes. now the potential for tornado warnings in the Midwest. What's up? Yeah, we know it's spring when I really wasn't expecting to cover tornadoes, and all of a sudden a few pop up. Because, yeah. yeah, it's got that spring feeling. Obviously, it's been that warm, so it's not a big surprise. But, yes, we already had reports of at least three or four tornadoes. Thankfully, they've been out in fields. We haven't heard any reports of any injuries or damage or anything like that. But we have this line here that goes from the Quad Cities to just outside of Milwaukee. And this is a new tornado warning near Delavan. This is southern Wisconsin. And this is moving at about 40 miles per hour. It'll be moving along Interstate 43 here. So we'll keep you posted on that. And our friends in the Quad Cities, you got a big thunderstorm right over the top of Davenport. Likely quarter-sized hail with this storm. So that's one of the stories that we're watching the rest of the afternoon. The fire situation in North Texas, the winds are light today. There are going to be light ish tomorrow 10 to 20 mile per hour gust but the real story is that we just need rain to kind of put these fires out and be done with this and this is how much rain is going to fall over the next seven days in the next week a couple drops in the bucket that is it so this story is not going away anytime soon until we get the next big rainmaker. and we did see the snow beginning in the portions of the sierra and it does look like we're going to see that on and off throughout tonight and these snow totals you know when we were like five to ten feet are coming people are like yeah sure ten feet yeah right all right sugar bowl 126 inches of snow in four days that is ten and a half feet this next storm Nothing compared to that, Hallie. This is just going to be about an inch and a half. And one thing that's important is it is now trended northwards, the Tahoe area and Yosemite, out of the winter storm warnings. This is mostly going to be southern Oregon, northern California. Are we out of the risk of avalanche warnings at this point? No, that will continue. And okay. especially now that we got all, you know, once the roads get cleared, the skiers are just drooling. Yeah. They're waiting to get out there. So, yeah, they're going to have a lot of avalanche uh, mitigation efforts going on right. in the next couple of days. And, you know, the dynamite in the hills knocking the snow down because yeah. it can be very dangerous. Some mountains are only letting people go up with avalanche gear on. So that means beacons and everything else because it is dangerous. That's smart. You can't be too safe. Bill Karens, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Let's take you back home to Washington now because the vice president there meeting with the top Israeli leader in the last couple of hours as she's giving a pretty blunt message to Israel. Watch. Far too many Palestinian civilians, innocent civilians have been killed. We need to get more aid in. We need to get the hostages out. And that remains our position. Another layer to the drama here. One of the war cabinet members of Israel, Benny Gantz, is in Washington defying Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who didn't even want him to go. The vice president's sharp line here comes just 24 hours after she called for an immediate ceasefire and criticized Israel for not doing enough to stop, in her words, the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. For his part, President Biden says he's going to push hard to try to get more help to the people who need it, to those innocent civilians in Gaza. You're seeing here the airdrops that started just within the last 72 hours, something like 38,000 meals dropped into Gaza. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who is posted up near the White House for us tonight. Aaron, it's an interesting tonal, if not shift for the vice president, then certainly the stage that she's on. She is being vocal about this. Talk us through what's happening behind the scenes here. Is she floating some of these trial balloons for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the administration here? Uh, it, it would seem not. The vice president, uh, you just played a clip of, of her this afternoon stopping in a hallway to talk to the media as she was leaving an event where she spoke uh, that was not a, a planned event, at least not one that we knew about prior to her appearing there. But she did make the point that uh, her, the comments she made both today and yesterday in Alabama were in lockstep with what President Biden has said and what the administration has been putting forward uh, since the early days of this conflict in Gaza. We did just get the a readout from the vice president's meeting with Benny Gantz, that member of the Israeli war cabinet, where we're told she reiterated, of course, U.S. support for Israel in its fight against Hamas, but also was very vocal in that meeting about uh, her concerns around the humanitarian situation, the conditions in Gaza right now, and the intense and growing need for humanitarian aid to get into Gaza to help people who are suffering there. She also called on Hamas, we understand, in that meeting to accept the terms for a uh, a deal that are on that are on the table right now. This deal would uh, mean an immediate ceasefire of six weeks, and it would also mean the, uh, the 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 ability to get more aid into Gaza. As I said, this is something the administration has been saying uh, in, in the last several weeks. In particular, we've been hearing it from so many different places around the administration, including today from the State Department. Listen. I will let them speak to their uh, own decision making. Um, the point that we make to them is that the situation as it stands now is unacceptable and everyone involved needs to do more. 
The vice president urging Benny Gantz to do more, for Israel to do more, to get more aid into Gaza faster. And Hallie, when uh, Benny Gantz meets with the secretary of state tomorrow here in D.C., he'll probably hear that message again. On the Hill as well, Benny Gantz uh, making some of those stops that are so key here in Washington. Aaron Gilchrist live for us outside the White House. Thank you. The man responsible for what's being called one of the worst national security breaches in years pleading guilty today to six counts under the Espionage Act. We're talking about Massachusetts Air National Guardsman Jack Teixeira, who's admitted to leaking hundreds of classified documents on Discord. Justice Department officials saying the punishment definitely fits the crime. Listen. He violated his duty to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And he abused his position of trust given to him by the American government. He didn't care at all about the consequences. Teixeira faces up to 17 years in prison after this moment. Remember these very dramatic images? It was like breaking news when it happened. These aerials showing him getting arrested. Since he was apparently able to leak documents, included in ones related to America's spying efforts, Russia's war in Ukraine for months. NBC's Tom Winter is following this one for us. Tom, this kind of felt like a reckoning moment here, right? Like... A, a moment for the Department of Justice to say, like, this will not be tolerated. Yeah, enough is enough. And I mean, remember that an inspector general's report by the uh, by the Air Force looked at this and actually put disciplinary actions against 15 of their members saying, you guys knew that he was doing these deep dives. He was literally going down the rabbit hole. Hundreds of searches, prosecutors say, for classified information. Stuff he shouldn't have had access stuff, to. Stuff he should not have been looking at. He was not in a position of need to know. And that's what they targeted. And it sounds like something out of a spy movie, but frankly it is. And it's information that was not at all germane to the task that he was assigned to. He's doing it and then he puts it out there. You know, you look at that that big FBI presence when they were searching the home and when yeah. they went to make the arrest. You remember when that he happened? His, it was like wall to wall. Wall to wall. And he had his gun safe two feet from his bed. Oof. If you look at his bedroom, it's set up, it looks like some sort of an army nest with camouflage. He's got uh, schematics for a car that he wanted to use as an, as an assassination car. This is somebody who had made a number of threats before. Serious questions as to why he was allowed into the military in the first place and now somebody who's part of frankly a long list of people over the past several years who have been uh, individuals who have been part of the Department of Defense who have been either part of the CIA who've been involved with sharing some of our crown jewels yeah. of our intelligence so when you put it together he obviously looked at the evidence and said 60 years versus 16 and change anybody can do that math mm -hmm. and so he decides to go for this guilty plea but I think it raises some troubling questions as far as the amount of material that just anybody has access to in the JWIC system, which is the computer system that he used to get this information. So um, it's certainly a day of reckoning, as you put it, and it'll be interesting to see if we see other types of cases like this as kind of this new generation, people that are used to going into deep dives in their early 20s get continued access to these types of systems. Tom Winter, thank you so much for that update on a story we've been following, as you know, for a long time. Appreciate exactly. it. You got it. Coming up. A mass prison escape in Haiti. Thousands of inmates breaking out. The state of emergency there will tell you how they're trying to get things somewhat under control. Plus, by one of the U.S.'s biggest universities is suspending Greek life, period. The U.S. Embassy in Haiti telling all Americans, get out ASAP. You've got American Airlines canceling flights with Haiti's government declaring a state of emergency tonight, there's also a curfew that goes into place tonight. That's after armed gangs stormed two of the country's biggest prisons in a huge prison break. Look at this. Look at what happened after. You had thousands of inmates fleeing the prisons. They were escaping as part of those coordinated attacks with at least nine people killed, four of them police officers. The deadly scenes, the latest tensions ratcheting up in the country. And it's part of this bigger push from some of these powerful gangs to get the prime minister to resign. I want to bring in Guad Venegas now. Tell us more about this prison break. It is dramatic. You've seen some of the images of the aftermath that are just difficult to see. What's the plan to try to get things under control? 
Well, Hallie, there's been a plan to try to get things under control for the last year, and of course, authorities have been unable to. Uh, it's estimated that the gangs control about 80% of Port-au-Prince, so it's going to be quite difficult for them to do anything to get back control of the streets, especially because now it seems like the gangs are organized, and the result of this prison break um, shows how powerful they are. They not only attack the prison, they also attack police stations, they attack the National Football Stadium and the International Airport. Uh, today, American, some American airlines uh, have suspended flights temporarily to Haiti. And when you look at the situation in Haiti, which has been deteriorating uh, for months now, uh, there's about 11 million people in Haiti and only 9,000, as that's estimated, 9,000 national police officers. So it's impossible for them to regain uh, this control. We've seen the violence taking place in the streets, but essentially Haiti, uh, many security experts have said, is now a failed state with the prime minister traveling to Kenya to try to get help from a force that would be coming. Now this happens. Uh, the gangs want the prime minister to step down. He has been the prime minister after the former leader of Haiti was assassinated. So it's been quite chaotic and it's difficult uh, to believe that with the current police force in Haiti, they will be able to regain control. Guad, can you give us a sense of the fallout sort of regionally, internationally here? Because what happens in Haiti, uh, you know, the world is watching. The world has been watching, Hallie. In fact, the United Nations met to discuss how uh, help could be sent into Haiti. So that's when they agreed that Kenya would provide a security force. And then now the issue is that inside of Kenya, there's been some debate with the legislature uh, about sending these peacekeeping officers to Haiti. And that's why the prime minister traveled to Kenya. Meanwhile, in Haiti, there's a local gang leader, a very powerful gang leader known as Barbecue, who's now even speaking on camera, saying he is vowing to have the prime minister step down and to take control of Haiti. He uh, was one of the leaders that organized what happened over the weekend. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult uh, for any force to take control. Now, this gang leader does not want the Kenyan police force to come into Haiti. That's one of the things that he has been opposing because he believes that they will come in to serve the current prime minister who he stands against. So a very chaotic situation, Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you so much for that reporting. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the former CFO of the Trump Organization pleading guilty to two counts of perjury today. It's in connection with the testimony Alan Weisselberg gave during Mr. Trump's civil fraud trial. One source telling NBC News that Weisselberg was not expected to enter into an agreement that would make him testify at any future trial. Sentencing set for next month. Number two, more than 100 indigenous women in Greenland are suing Denmark today for more than $6 million because these women say Denmark forced them to get IUDs decades ago without their consent. We've talked about this on the show before. These women say Danish health officials violated their human rights. Officials in Greenland and Denmark have not yet responded to NBC's request for comment. Number three, more than 60,000 pounds of chicken soup dumplings from Trader Joe's Recalled for potentially containing hard plastic from like a permanent marker, Trader Joe's says the recalled dumplings have a best buy date of March 2nd. They're telling people, throw them away. Please don't eat like, you know, those dumplings or return them. No reports, fortunately, of anybody getting sick or getting hurt. Number four, the queen is reportedly taking a bit of a break from royal duties after filling in for King Charles after his cancer diagnosis. 76-year-old is going to lay low for a week until next Monday when she'll represent the crown at the annual Commonwealth Day celebration. Number five, an emotional day. Emotional day for Jason Kelsey, for the Eagles family, because guess what? He is worst kept secret, right? We've known this He's officially retiring from the NFL. Watch a little bit of this. See if you can not cry. I am brought back to this day. <laughs> Oh man, kissing his wife there, Kylie. I mean, what a what a player, what an athlete, what a couple, what a champion, because he is, he is a champion. He played with the Eagles for his entire career, 13 years in the NFL. He says, thank you, Philly, from the bottom of my heart. And you know what Philly says back to him? Thank you, Jason Kelsey. You are, um, you are iconic and you will always be iconic. All right, what do you want me to say? I'm an Eagles fan, man. We had to get that, it's, it touches me, it, it gets to you, you know? 
I'm an Eagles fan, but I'm also a political reporter, which is why we're going to talk about Super Tuesday. Because guess what? We are only 12 hours away now, maybe 13 or so, from the first polls opening. It is the biggest day of the primary calendar, just in terms of, like, sheer number of people voting. Look at the map. 16 states plus American Samoa. They say it, sea to shining sea, coast to coast, pick your phrase, but that's who's voting here tomorrow. And this year, Super Tuesday could essentially serve as the springboard for the general election. Here's our breakdown. It's the single biggest election day on the primary calendar, Super Tuesday. Voters representing states with more than 134 million people, nearly half the country. It can be the climax of the season when the competition thins out, like in 2020, when more moderates dropped out and backed Joe Biden on the Democratic side, launching him to the nomination. The drama, less intense this time. President Biden has no serious challenger, and there are just two left on the Republican side, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. For Haley, it may be make or break. We're going to keep going all the way through Super Tuesday. That's as far as I've thought in terms of going forward. We've that promise coming just hours before she lost her home state of South Carolina. She's lost seven states that have voted so far by about a two-thirds to one margin. Her only win? Washington, D.C., where just 2,000 people voted. Haley We're with our Kristen Welker about her expectations for Tuesday. That's always been the case in every step is can we continue to stay competitive? When 70 percent of Americans say they don't want Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you keep going to make sure people have a choice. Remember where things stand. Donald Trump has 247 delegates, Nikki Haley 43. And in some states, just getting some votes won't help her much. Five of these states award candidates all their delegates for the person who wins at least 50 percent of the vote, like Mr. Trump has done in every state so far. But technically, the Republican race won't be over after tomorrow night, because even if Donald Trump has a gangbusters evening, he still can't hit the magic number to clinch the nomination, 1,215. That could come as early as next week. That, of course, uh, would leave Nikki Haley theoretically alive to fight another day. After tomorrow, still no firm answer to see what she'll decide to do. Super Tuesday special coverage picks up right here, however you're watching. Tomorrow, starting at 5 o'clock Eastern with myself and Tom Yamas, we'll then be joined by Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie, who will lead our special reporting on NBC at 10 o'clock Eastern. And then Kristen Walker picks it up after that. Don't, don't, I mean, just listen. That's a, get ready. Get ready, because it's going to be intense. It's going to be amazing when we come back. What's behind a surprise that's raising questions about power and access to China's top leaders. Plus, take a look how these horses ended up running wild. Uh, yeah, that's a highway. That's a soft gallop. No, that's a full gallop. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can get tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our West Coast Bureau, three passengers on that Alaska Airlines plane where a door plug blew off mid-flight. They are now suing both the airline and Boeing for a billion dollars. They're accusing both companies of negligence for allegedly ignoring warning signs. Boeing and Alaska Airlines declined to comment. The FAA and NTSB, of course, are still investigating what happened in this incident back in January. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the University of Maryland is suspending Greek life after a bunch of reports of unsafe activities, as they describe it. In a letter, the school's telling frats and sororities to stop recruiting, stop any events with alcohol pending an investigation. And listen, this letter does not use the word hazing. But it does reference stuff that the school says threatened the safety and well-being of students. And out of our Midwest Bureau, a different, oh, a, di a different kind of horsepower, guys, on the highway. Do you get it? Because it's actual horses. Two police horses that apparently got loose during a routine exercise. There they go. A little bit of a trot, trot across the highway there. That's scary for the horses. Also, obviously, disruptive to traffic. Fortunately, some other police officers on horseback caught up with them and got those horses home safe. Rounded them up, got them back. A little bit of the Wild West there in Ohio. Overseas now, and a surprise move today with Beijing saying for the first time in 30 years, China's premier is not going to talk with reporters after the country's yearly legislative meeting. Okay, if you're like, so what? This is a big deal because there really aren't many opportunities for journalists to question top Chinese leaders, except for this thing that happens yearly. Comes as the government has declared, it says, its commitment to transparency and to fostering a friendly business environment 
Even as the Chinese President Xi Jinping consolidates his power and pushes other officials into less visible roles. Josh Letterman is joining us now. And let's be clear, it's not as though China is considered a bastion of press transparency, right? But now even one of these rare opportunities to hold power to account is gone. That's right. And it's certainly sending the signal, Hallie, that China's uh, top leaders don't want to answer tough questions uh, from journalists, because this tradition has dated back to 1993. It was really the marquee event of the annual parliamentary uh, summit. And over the years, uh, you know, a lot of the questions were screened in advance, but there were opportunities to ask uh, the Chinese premier about things like human rights violations, about uh, challenges with the economy, which may be one of the reasons that China's leaders don't want to have uh, this news conference this year and in the coming years because uh, the Chinese economy uh, really has been suffering of late. Uh, a massive real estate crisis, diminishing foreign investment, as well as uh, economic growth rates that are really slowing. And so this will avert the need for China's leaders uh, to have to answer really specific questions about uh, the financial indicators, the, the state of their economy. Uh, but of course, it also really re reflects the fact that President Xi has consolidated power during his time. The premier, the number two role in the Chinese government is not nearly as powerful as it used to be. The other piece of this, too, is the way that, you know, we've talked about this before. Um, we've talked about it with our colleague Janice Mackey Freire as well. The idea of shifting sort of perspectives on Chinese social media, the idea that censors were regulating discussion of this change there. Um, how do you see that fitting into the bigger picture, Josh? Because, it, again, I think it's very different for American viewers, we, you know, who can largely get on social media platforms and, and share their opinions unfettered, so long as they don't infringe on others' rights. That's right. We're not used to doing a search on X, formerly Twitter or Facebook or anything else, and having it simply uh, not appear because the government doesn't want it to. But according to The New York Times, that's exactly what happened today on Chinese social media when people were searching for the phrasing of the statement that was put out announcing this news conference would not take place. It simply brought up an error message. And so it's a little bit ironic, given that this news conference in the past had been really one of the emblems of of China's claim that it is moving towards more transparency, towards a more democratic system, that it wants to be open to the rest of the world, especially uh, to business and foreign investment. And yet the mere fact that they're shutting down this news conference, they didn't really want people talking about on social media. And so we still uh, see the very clear uh, resistance that China's government has, especially under President Xi Jinping, to the type of transparency that is expected of most political systems around the world, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you very much for unpacking all of that for us tonight. Super interesting coming out of China. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, LeBron James and Drake betting big on the PGA Tour. Why their move may be more important than just the money involved. Coming up. So LeBron and Drake are coming to use their marketing power and, by the way, their powerful money to join a big push to help the PGA Tour fend off competition from Live Golf. Remember, Live is backed by the Saudis. This is according to new, new reporting from The New York Times. Uh, we've been covering this a bunch, right? The Live Tour, given literally hundreds of millions of dollars to the biggest names in golf. So now, most weekends when you flip on a PGA tournament, you may not see stars like Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, John Rahm. You can see there are some of the winningest players in golf. Brian Chung is joining us now. So what's interesting is that LeBron and, J and Drake, yep. LeBron, James, and Drake Huge names. are joining us. They're strategic investors, they yep. say. What does that mean? Because it means money, it means marketing, and it means trying to combat what Liv has, tr has tried to do here. Yeah, well, they certainly have money, right? But I think the bigger story with these two icons is just bringing the uh, power of their popularity to it as well. Because what we know is that there's a big, uh, basically, like, match, right, in terms of who can amass the most amount of money to bring in the big names in the golfing world itself. So Liv has a lot of Saudi money, sure, that's right? right. The PGA Tour needs to get their money as well. So yes, you have the money coming in from Drake and LeBron, but the idea here is to also use their names to bring popularity to the PGA Tour as well. LeBron has the connectedness to the global uh, sports world because of his uh, popularity as a ma massive NBA player. And Drake, obviously iconic in terms of the rapper scene, right? Money on my mind, mine on my money. He's got the money to be able to put it into it, but then also he might be like courtside, right? He's popular yeah. for being on the side of those Toronto 
Toronto Raptor game. So maybe he can lend some of that popularity to the PGA Tour as well to bring in that demographic. But what does this mean for that huge merger news, right? The idea that for the PGA Live merger, how does this play into that? Yeah, well, pending merger, right? So well, that's it, right. That's right. right. So we don't know exactly how it's going to work out. There was a game plan and agreement between PGA and Live to merge. That was supposed to be done by December 31st. They've been holding it off. We don't have an updated deadline as of now. So this is very interesting because, okay, you're looking at this pending merger. They don't know how this is going to go. So PGA has to prepare as for the possibility as if it might not happen. So if that happens, how are you going to fund yourself, right? That's why they got money. They have a $3 billion commitment from the strategic sports group. Maybe that's the rainy day fund. And part of this rainy day fund is also the celebrity of these two massive icons as well. So we'll see how that works out. What's interesting is what it sounds like what you're almost saying is like the idea being that LeBron Drake, this strategic investment fund, trying to compete with all that Saudi money that Liv has. Yeah, and that's going to be very important if the merger doesn't go through. Now, if the merger does go through, I guess they still have Drake and LeBron maybe showing up at the, you know, at, at the events. But at the end of the day, again, they have, they have to do a little bit of, uh, 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 I guess, planning, if you will, in case that doesn't end up uh, happening at all. Brian Chung, great to see you yeah, in likewise. person in New York here. Thanks for being here, friend. Yeah. Still to come, another potential game changer. This one for the world of college sports. How a union push at one Ivy League school could maybe spell the end of the NCAA as we know it. Oh yeah, more on that in just a sec. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And with March Madness coming up pretty quickly, we could see an election tomorrow that could change college sports forever. No, no, not Super Tuesday. This one up in New Hampshire, when the 15 members of Dartmouth College men's basketball team will vote to potentially, maybe, form the first ever union in college sports. Now, the results will stay hidden, so to speak, for a little bit while Dartmouth appeals, but it is a big shift, right, if it happens, that could essentially end the NCAA as we know it. Here's Maura Barrett with more. Kate Haskins and Romeo Myrtle are like most students at Dartmouth. Every day is work and school, school and work. Except the work they do doesn't come with a paycheck. Why? Because they're on the men's basketball team. We don't get a stipend or any type of benefit for being athletes, even though we are, you know, working like full-time jobs basically by being on the team. The only way college athletes can get money for playing is through what's called name, image, and likeness. Basically, it lets players earn money for things like autographs, appearances, coaching, merch, video games, or endorsements, just not directly for what they do on the field. Some, like Southern California's Bronny James or LSU's Libby Dunn, can rack up big bucks. But those opportunities don't exist for every athlete. That's why Haskins and Myrtle decided to form a union to get compensated like other student employees with hourly wages wages similar to other student wages on campus or scholarships. Both players have had to take on what are essentially third jobs. Haskins has experience with unions, though, helping start one at the dining hall on campus. We just saw the impacts and how influential their voices became um, once they actually became a union. There's a lot more power. Athletes have tried this before. The city was seeking to form a labor union. Back in 2015, the National Labor Relations Board rejected Northwestern football's bid to form a union. But a decade later, a shift. Now, the NLRB is backing their bid, ruling the men's basketball team performs work in exchange for compensation in the form of gear, food, lodging, and tickets, since Ivy League athletes don't get scholarships. Dartmouth is appealing the ruling, telling NBC News unionization is not appropriate in this instance. The costs of Dartmouth's athletic program far exceed any revenue for the program. But Haskins and Myrtle already have their sights set on something bigger, overturning the whole system. At the core of all of this, it challenges the term that we see so often in the conference of you guys being student athletes. What do you make of that term? Do you agree with it? I mean, no. It's a it's an old term and it was used to kind of keep the the athletes as students first and kind of de-emphasize the athlete part of it and the fact that they actually do work for the college. Sports law expert Michael McCann says these rulings could put the entire NCAA on notice. It's a game changer for college sports. So there would be a fundamental shift in the NCAA's model from a model where by rule the schools cannot pay the athletes and that makes them amateurs. College players are, have a big role in terms of generating revenue, uh, generating fundraising, generating admissions. So schools might rethink some of their numbers. 
The NCAA has not responded to our request for comment, but it has a key factor working in its favor. Public schools like Alabama, Ohio State, and Michigan aren't covered by the NLRB, so there's no sign athletes at those schools could form unions yet. But more than a third of the D1 schools are private, leaving them wide open to take that step. For Haskins and Myrtle, they're now focusing on bringing together the whole Ivy League under one roof. We're not the only ones frustrated with the Ivy League and uh, with our own school. It's, it's everybody. You know, everyone feels like we're being used in the Ivy League, and, and we want to make, we want to change that. Maura is joining us now. You saw her there, obviously, in those interviews. Maura, super interesting. There's also a bit of a political tie-in here, too. Explain that. There's always a political tie-in, right, yeah. Hallie? If you didn't know, the president of the NCAA now is Charlie Baker, the same Charlie Baker who was the Republican governor of Massachusetts. He's a political player that's used to navigating big change in an institution, the NCAA, that's resistant to that kind of change. He was the Republican governor in a very liberal Massachusetts, so he's working on threading that needle to balance both sides. Now, what's more is that the president of the United States actually chooses the general counsel of the NLRB, and so we know that President Joe Biden is very uh, favorable to unions, but this could drag on until well past November, well past election season. Former President Trump hasn't taken a stance on this political particular issue, but that could make a difference in this ultimate de decision, depending on what we see in November, Holly. Maura Barrett, uh, thank you very much for that reporting and for bringing us that story from Dartmouth. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. what you could call a 2024 win for former President Trump with maybe more right around the corner. First, that decision coming down from the Supreme Court to keep the former president on the ballot in all 50 states. Why the justices made that call and what it means for Mr. Trump's White House push. Then we are just hours from the first primary poll opening in 15 states for Super Tuesday. Our teams out on the trail covering what could be Nikki Haley's last stand. Everything you wanted to know about Super Tuesday coming up. Plus, across the country, we're on the ground as people recover from absolutely wild weather. California digging out from 10 feet of snow. But in Texas, firefighters are struggling to contain the worst wildfire in that state's history. We're live in both places. And more shifts from the White House when it comes to Israel, or at least a new tone, what the Israelis are saying about the latest push for a pause in fighting. Then in Haiti, a serious warning to Americans, get out now. The scary scenes from a mass gang-related prison break, putting U.S. officials on high alert, and the country on the verge of a full-on collapse. That's coming up a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, former President Trump is calling it a big day for liberty, in his view, after the Supreme Court handed him what's basically a win for his 2024 campaign. Listen. Essentially, you cannot take somebody out of a race because an opponent would like to have it that way. While most uh, states were thrilled to have me, you know, there were some that didn't, and they didn't want that for political reasons. The Supreme Court ruling unanimously that Donald Trump should stay on the ballot in Colorado, on the primary ballot. If they had gone the other way, the whole presidential race could have gotten thrown into chaos there. Now, remember the question here. It centers on whether the former president intentionally organized and incited a mob on January 6th. Six Coloradans who sued argued yes. Now, the justices, they didn't make a decision on that piece of it, on whether or not that's true. But they do agree that individual states shouldn't just be able to kick candidates off the ballot if they're running for a federal office. It's under this section of the 14th Amendment here that bans insurrectionists from holding office. The justices basically say it's, it's like a hot mess if candidates were to get taken off the ballot in some states but not in others. The whole ruling here is significant because this decision doesn't just keep Donald Trump on the ballot in Colorado, but in Maine and Illinois also, where some similar cases have come up. And the timing, that's key, right? Because, look, Colorado is one of the states that votes tomorrow on Super Tuesday. So is Maine, by the way. We'll talk about what we can expect in this landscape with Garrett Hake and Ali Vitale in just a sec. But I want to start with our Ken Delanian, who's back home for us in Washington. A unanimous decision, Ken. You don't see a ton of those from the Supreme Court justices in these high-profile cases. But it wasn't necessarily unanimous thinking, right? Talk us through some of the subtleties here. That's right, Hallie. The court split on the question of enforcing this provision of the 14th Amendment. The majority decided that only an act of Congress could enforce it. And the three liberal justices, joined by Amy 
Coney Barrett, wrote a concurring opinion where they said that went too far because it foreclosed other potential avenues of enforcement. For example, if someone filed a federal lawsuit and got a judge to rule that Mr. Trump was an insurrectionist, uh, that could have, uh, in theory, prevented him from being on the ballot and not be subject to this state-by-state -state issue. But the majority wasn't having it. And so uh, the, the liberals were really almost annoyed by that. I want to read you a, a little excerpt from their uh, concurring opinion. They said, the court today needed to resolve only a single question, whether an individual state may keep a presidential candidate found to have engaged in insurrection off its ballot. In a sensitive case crying out for judicial rest restraint, it abandons that course, Hallie. It's an important decision, Ken, obviously, right? I mean, the Supreme Court, when we think about the Supreme Court and politics, you think back to, like, Bush v. Gore, and the Supreme Court has more really big decisions coming up, at least one of them. It's this presidential immunity case that they're also looking at. We know they're going to hear arguments the week of April 22nd, and then it's going to be all eyes on a potential decision from there. Yeah, that's right. And already by their actions and how they took this case, they have made it very controversial. And remember, this is a court that is held in low esteem. Only 41 percent of Americans, according to polls, approve of the, its job performance. And this, this court, after first turning down special counsel Jack Smith, his request to urgently hear this immunity question, they waited till the appeals court ruled. Now they're taking it up in April. We, th that means we may not see a ruling until June. And that substantially delays uh, the potential federal criminal trial on, uh, against Mr. Trump uh, on the, those allegations that he tried to overturn the election. And that has an impact on the election. Um, and it shows that the court is playing a significant role. It's not a role that the court welcomes, uh, but it's a role that has been foisted on them nonetheless. Ken Delaney, live for us in Washington. Ken, thanks. On that note, let me go to Garrett Haig from West Palm Beach, Florida. And all along, Garrett, you've had the Trump campaign talking about, you know, the idea of this intersection between the political and the legal calendar. You have made the case, I think, effectively based on your reporting. It's all one calendar, right? It's all one lane. It's all one bucket. Yeah, I mean, look, today's a pretty good example of that. It's the day before Super Tuesday, and Donald Trump's not in Texas or California or Minnesota or Arkansas or any state that's going to award delegates. He's here in Florida, where today his only campaign-related activity really was this brief news conference he gave responding to the Colorado decision. And in that time, he talked about Colorado only very briefly. After that, he kind of tried to sweep together all of the various legal cases against him or featuring him into one overarching argument that he is somehow being interfered with on his quest for the White House, and he started working the refs, if you will, on what he sees as the most important of those cases, this question of whether he will have presidential immunity in the two big federal cases. Here's what he had to say about that and the Supreme Court. If a president doesn't have full immunity, you really don't have a president. A president has to be free. A president has to be, if the president does a good job, I did. Obviously, this is the case that sort of on which all the other cases hinge, Hallie, whether or not he has immunity from prosecution, a key focus legally and obviously a key focus politically as we move into the summer and the fall and possibly the start of these trial dates even closer to the fall election. And as we talk about and you, you said this sort of right right at the start there, right, the idea that he is where you are in South Florida here for Super Tuesday. He is not necessarily out on the campaign trail. He is trying to cast his eyes ahead to the general election versus Joe Biden, even while Nikki Haley is still in this race. Talk through expectations for tomorrow from the Trump campaign. Yeah, that's right. I and mean, there are a couple things at play here. First of all, the Trump campaign does expect to do very well tomorrow. They know mathematically they cannot clinch the nomination, right. even if they sweep all 15 states that are in play, although they think a sweep is uh, between possible and likely. They're, they're pretty optimistic about the possibility of sweeping, but they hope to certainly kind of push Nikki Haley even further out of the national conversation so they can focus more on Joe Biden and the general. The one other thing I'll point out is that this is also at least in part a financial decision. This version of the Trump campaign is much less inclined towards having those mega rallies that make for good television and good ego management for the candidate, but are not necessarily super effective ways to turn out voters where they need them. They're not going to do that kind of thing right now in the hopes of stewarding their resources better to a fall campaign that every poll, every data point we have suggests will be extremely competitive. Garrett Hake, uh, live for us there in South Florida. Garrett, thank you. Let me bring in Ali Vitali now, who is in one of those Super Tuesday states, of course, Texas. And Ali, you heard Garrett lay it out, right, the perspective from Team Trump, looking at the potential maybe for a sweep. Tell me what you're hearing from your sources in and around Nikki Haley's team. 
look, sweep seems likely, Hallie, especially because the Haley team sees the polls that we're all seeing. That being said, Nikki Haley on another network today seemed to say that there were some internal metrics that they were hoping to hit. She also was clear to say she wasn't willing to share what those were. But honestly, that is how this campaign has operated the entire time. They might have these internal metrics, but they certainly don't share them publicly. It's why we haven't seen Haley or her senior campaign managers uh, say that they think they're going to win in X state or Y state. The fact that they notched a win in D.C., yes, badly needed, but also doesn't do much to stem the tide of what we're seeing from the Trump campaign, which is the likely or possible, to borrow Garrett's phrasing, expectation that they are going to sweep in Super Tuesday. All of that being said, it doesn't stop Nikki Haley from reacting in a way that sort of bolsters the Trump campaign position on things like what we saw today out of the Supreme Court. Watch what she said about that ruling. You don't ever want some elected official in a state or anybody else saying who can and can't be on a ballot. This is America. This is America. Look, I'll defeat Donald Trump fair and square, but I want him on that ballot. So they are Haley reacting to the decision to keep Trump on the Colorado ballot, saying she hopes to defeat him at the ballot box, but polls show, again, just how much of a long shot that really is. Can I ask you, Alice, somebody who has covered this candidate now for months, right, with this unique perspective of being on the ground, on the road for so long, has anything surprised you about the point where we are now in this race, one day now, 13 hours ahead of the start of Super Tuesday? You know, I really am actually surprised by the fact that Haley is willing to criticize Trump to a point. Mm. The fact now that she's not willing to go all the way there, as she says she's the alternative for voters, the fact that she's not willing to go all the way there and just sort of accept that the voters we meet who say they're voting for Haley, yeah, a lot of them like her, they're voting for her, but they're also voting against Donald Trump. And Nikki Haley still tries to do this dance of, well, I'm not the anti-Trump candidate, I'm just a different candidate. The reality in this Republican party is if you're not Trump and you're running against him, you are the anti-Trump candidate innately. That is the option that you're providing voters. The fact that Haley is still trying to do a dance around that and be delicate about that, I think is surprising to me. And it's why her leaving this door open on will she or won't she endorse. I get why she's trying to keep that as a live ball so that people continue to pay attention and it makes her words carry more weight. But at the same time, I think that voters really need to know that at this point. Are you someone who is going to keep going and and try to prevent him from getting this nomination because you think he can't win a general, which is really Haley's only argument yeah, against core. Trump at this point, despite the January 6th of it all, despite everything else. But I-, I do think that she's keeping that as a live ball for a reason. But at the same time, it is pretty surprising that she can't answer questions like what I asked her, which is, could you vote for a convicted criminal at the end of the day? Ali Vitali, a lot to watch, I think, over the course of the next 24 hours, 48, 72 yeah. hours. Thank you so much. We'll be watching it all together. We'll all be there starting tomorrow night right here on NBC News Now, 5 o'clock Eastern. However you're watching, I'll be joined by Tom Yamas and then later Kristen Welker along with Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie leading our coverage on the NBC side at 10 Eastern as well. Six hours, get ready, buckle in, tune in. We'll see you then. Take you out west now because right now you've got millions of people digging themselves out after a blockbuster snowstorm slammed parts of the west. They're used to snow in some of these parts of the state. This was 10 feet of snow. Okay, in some spots, 10 plus feet. And in some areas, wind that was stronger than a Category 5 hurricane, more than 190 miles an hour. That is not the norm this time of year in this location. You had, look at this, cars having to get dragged out. You had a big highway shut down for about 100 miles, homes buried, and now more snow on the way. Steve Patterson is is in the thick of it in California. Not another 10 feet of snow on the way, at least, Steve, if there is a silver lining to this huge cloud that is hanging over your state. But talk to me about what you've been seeing as folks have just gotten a, a huge wallop out there. Not another 10 feet, but people don't want another inch right now. This storm was ridiculous. I said that before. I'll say it again. It was 72 hours of purely consistent, ceaseless snowfall, sometimes blowing sideways, sometimes falling straight down, but it never stopped almost for a single second. Five to 10 feet of snow, as you mentioned, in some of the mountain communities, you go lower, that total drops lower, you go higher, it goes higher. 12 feet up in the mountain areas with 190 mile an hour 
now were wind gusts. That is unheard of for a storm like this, and it happened here. Of course, the worst of it had to be on the roads. Interstate 80 was just slammed. Uh, Spinouts, roll-offs off of the side of the road. People had to abandon their cars and trucks on the road. The CHP, California Highway Patrol, had to go on the highway, rescue people off of the highway. They left everything on the highway. Then they shut down the highway for about three days. This is the major art of, uh, uh, artery, the, the, the sort of the, the thing that connects the entire mountain region, this one interstate, and it was shut down for that long. So that means also people were essentially cut off in their communities, snowed in in a lot of cases because they couldn't really move around. That is the level of storm that we we're talking about. Thankfully, as we've been sort of mentioning, it is kind of over. Uh, and I'll say it is over because that storm is gone. Another system is rolling in. I wouldn't call it a storm because it's going to drop some flurries. We'll get another foot or two in the mountains, but here lower, uh, you know, a couple inches. But again, like we've been saying, a couple inches is not good when it's on top of the 10 feet that's already on the ground and the flurries are starting to fall as we speak. Hallie. Steve Patterson, no kidding. Uh, stay warm out there. I know you and so many others will be hoping that that is the case there in Truckee. Thanks, Steve. Let's take you to Texas because also happening right now, millions of people are under wildfire alerts yet again because firefighters just cannot get a handle on one of the biggest fires in Texas history. Strong winds are keeping this thing going. It is so bad that the governor of a different state, the governor of California, is sending their National Guard in to now help fight this thing. More than a million acres, look at this, a million acres burned to a crisp. Fire and smoke just off into the distance there. Our Morgan Chesky is joining us now. It's, it can be hard, I think, for people to wrap their heads around the sheer scope, the size of this thing. Morgan, talk us through it. Yeah, incredibly well said, Hallie. You can literally get on a highway here in Fritch, Texas, and drive for two hours to Canadian, Texas. And the majority of that drive, you will see charred landscapes. That is what a burn area looks like when it consumes more than a million acres, which is what this Smokehouse Creek fire has done. One of just five named fires here in the Texas Panhandle. And let's look at it by the numbers, though. More than a million acres burned. We have more than 500 buildings that have authorities say have been lost as a result of these fast-moving flames. And unfortunately, the most tragic number of all here, Hallie, two lives have been lost from this fire that started a week ago today. And pretty much every single day since then, a new portion of the Texas panhandle has burned. It's certainly leaving everyone feeling that they're not even out of the woods. Even though the winds have died down, there is so much fuel around here that can burn that has officials saying this. Take a listen. It's inevitable that we're going to get another start. You believe that? It, whether it's a power line, somebody dragging chains, a truck backfiring something over into the growth, anything. Just, just one spark. Just one spark. And speaking of power lines, one woman who lives in Canadian Texas and lost her home is now uh, pursuing a lawsuit against a utility provider, Excel Energy. In this lawsuit, Hallie, she's saying that because they failed to maintain a power pole, it fell down, snapping at its base, putting those power lines close to that dry grass. And the lawsuit alleges that is what caused this fire. The fire chief of a neighboring community says his team did observe at least one power pole down uh, wow. right around the time this fire fire began. In the meantime, there was an entirely different fire that played out last night, not too far from where we are uh, in neighboring Sanford. That small community had to be evacuated. Hallie, this town had to be evacuated for the third time from a wildfire in less than a week. Wow. The stress of that, even when they go back home and their home is fine, the sheer recurrence is weighing very heavily on everyone here. It's just Allie? disruptive, to say the least. Morgan Chesky, right in the thick of it there in Texas. Morgan, thank you so much for that. Giving us that 30,000-foot view is meteorologist Bill Karens, because, Bill, you are tracking more severe weather right there in the Midwest, maybe tornadoes. Yeah, we didn't even have a slight risk of severe storms today. Yeah. So this happens in the springtime. The conditions are just right. We're warm enough, and we get these storms to pop up, especially at the end of the afternoon. Once the sun goes down a little bit, we lose that peak heating. These will start to weaken. Uh, I know one storm chaser has already encountered three different tornadoes, all in open fields, no damage, no one hurt or anything wow. like that. But we still at least have the chance of some of that. We've had dotted areas of severe weather from Milwaukee all 
all the way down through the Quad Cities past Burlington. I do see a new tornado when it just popped up, too. So here's the Milwaukee area. You are going to see some heavy rain and thunderstorms rolling through. Down Interstate 43, not a pretty drive. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people seeing hail with this storm that just exited Elkhorn, but that severe thunderstorm warning has just been dropped. There's another strong one that's going to cross Interstate 39. This is just outside of DeKalb here and not far from Rockford. And I did mention that other one with a new tornado warning as we head towards the Missouri-Illinois border. So we'll continue to monitor and see if anything gets produced, but that should be weakening as the sun's going down. The other story, of course, the fire weather in Texas. That story will not go away until we get rain. Uh, it's going to get windy again in the middle of this week and zero rain. I mean, oh, practically man. zero rain for the next seven days. So this story, uh, we really going to need a big rainstorm just to put all the fires out, and that will kind of end our brush fire season early in uh, the plains. The storm for the west, this one is trending good. It's trending north up into areas of northern California near Mount Shasta or in the southern Cascades. So we're not going to add a lot on top of these incredible numbers that we saw. Easily the biggest storm in the Tahoe area, the Reno, all the way through Palisades. 93 Palisades, Tahoe. And what was really impressive is I have no clue how they even measured that. Because they had 192 mile per hour wind gusts. And if you could just picture what snow would be like in that. So it was, I don't know how they measured these numbers, but it, it, epic storm. Let's just put it that way. There's snow drifts 15 feet high in some places. And the winter storm warnings have been dropped for Tahoe. That's good because they were thinking possibility of another foot of snow later tonight. No longer the case. Maybe just a couple inches. But Mount Shasta, Medford, Southern Cascades, and then eventually heading towards Yellowstone, we're going to get some of this snow. So here's the snow forecast. There's Jackson. There's Sun Valley. I'm just mentioning all the great ski places here. But uh, this is the area that. If anyone's traveling in in Northern California, it shouldn't be too bad. I know Interstate 80 has been closed the last couple days. They've opened it back up. Chains required. It's a little bit of snow tonight. I think they should be able to keep that open. So here's the timing of this as we go. This storm will eventually, by the way, head down the California coast, bringing some rain to areas like San Francisco as we go throughout early Wednesday morning. Los Angeles, it looks like for you during Wednesday afternoon. But again, not a high impact event, Allie. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that severe weather. You too. listen, you mentioned all those ski areas, and like I'm sure skiers are digging it, but also there's a risk there, right? I mean, we've seen avalanches this season already. Yeah, we've got a couple avalanche watches that are up. We'll see if we get warnings in the next couple of days. Where it gets dangerous is if you get like the heavy snow on top of ice or something like that, or right. if the temperatures warm up quickly, then it solidifies and then it can just the gains the weight as it goes. So we'll see how it plays out the next couple of days. That's good that there's no rain coming on top of it either. So that's know, true. Let's hope they can ski and enjoy it and be safe. That knock on wood. That's the hope. Bill Karens, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's take you back home to Washington now, because there we've seen the vice president meeting with the top Israeli leader in just the last couple of hours as she's hitting Israel with a pretty blunt message. Watch. Far too many Palestinian civilians, innocent civilians have been killed. We need to get more aid in. We need to get the hostages out. And that remains our position. It comes as we're just getting video in of Benny Gantz. He's a key member of the Israeli War Cabinet, leaving another big meeting on Capitol Hill. There he is. That's coming into us in just the last hour. Gantz, remember, is in Washington now defying the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu did not want Benny Gantz to show up here. Now you've got a meeting with members of Congress. We know that he's been there on the Hill, obviously talking with the vice president. And her sharp line here comes just 24 hours after she called for an immediate ceasefire, criticizing Israel for not doing enough to stop this, in her words, humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. President Biden, for his part, says he's going to try to get more help to the innocent civilians in Gaza who, needs it, who need it. You're looking at some airdrops now. 38,000 meals roughly dropped into Gaza. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who's posted up near the White House. Talk about the significance of this meeting between Vice President Harris and Benny Gantz and what it signals right now about the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. Well, Holly, you've got two uh, key leaders, obviously, the number two person here in the U.S. government, Vice President Harris, and you have the uh, a key opposition leader in Israel to uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. At the same time, he that opposition leader is now a member of the war cabinet that has been uh, that was put together after the Hamas attack on October 7th. Uh, so to have these two leaders meeting today is, the administration says, uh, a, a standard sort of aspect of the way they've been operating, uh, in a sense, since October 7th when uh, Benny Gantz reached out and said he'd like to meet with officials at the White House. They were willing to accommodate that. And so today he met with the vice president. He met separately with the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, and another deputy on the National Security Council to talk about uh, what Israel is doing on the ground in Gaza, a key part of the conversation in terms of what the military operations are, something the U.S. has been trying to keep abreast of uh, and also uh, offer some perspective about uh, for the Israelis, but also... Uh, 
uh, as the vice president indicated in some of her comments, uh, and as we understand from the readout from that meeting, she expressed deep concern about the humanitarian conditions in Gaza and the suffering that the Palestinian people have been enduring uh, over the last many months. Of course, we know that there was this aid drop over the weekend from the United States, and there have been other countries that have also dropped aid into Israel, or excuse me, into Gaza. And Halle, we understand that a key part of the conversation with the vice president today was how Israel needed to open up more ways for more aid, food, medicine, and the like to get into Gaza by air, by ground, and potentially by sea. References, Aaron, is the potential for maybe a temporary ceasefire, right? Any guidance on timeline on that front? No. You remember last week President Biden said that he thought that there might be a deal done by today, and then the uh, the incident with aid uh, and the people who were killed in Gaza uh, trying to get to some of the aid that was coming in on trucks. The president said he thought that that would be a setback. It seems, though, uh, as though it was not necessarily a setback. There is a, an offer on the table. The Biden administration has said at this point it is an offer that Hamas needs to take. Uh, Israel has done a significant portion of its part, according to U.S. officials, to, to, uh, to put out a deal that is uh, amenable to everybody involved. Now they're just waiting for Hamas to take the deal so that there can be a ceasefire, there can be a hostage release, and there can be more aid that gets into Gaza so the Palestinian people are able to, to feed their families and mm. to take care of the sick. Aaron Gilchrist, live for us there outside the White House tonight, back home in Washington. Aaron, thank you. The man responsible for what's being called one of the worst national security breaches in years, pleading guilty today to six counts under the Espionage Act. We're talking about Jack Teixeira, Massachusetts Air National Guardsman, who's admitting to leaking hundreds of classified documents on Discord with justice officials saying that the punishment, potentially up to 17 years in prison, fits the crime. Watch. He violated his duty to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And he abused his position of trust given to him by the American government. He didn't care at all about the consequences. Teixeira was apparently able to leak documents, including ones related to U.S. spying efforts and Russia's war in Ukraine for months before he was finally arrested. That's what you're seeing here. Do you remember that? Those really dramatic moments, those aerials of this happening at Teixeira's location? Last April, NBC's Tom Winter has been following all of this for us. He's joining us now. Tom, this kind of felt like a reckoning moment here, right? Like a, a moment for the Department of Justice to say, like, this will not be tolerated. Yeah, enough is enough. And I mean, remember that an inspector general's report by the uh, by the Air Force looked at this and actually put disciplinary actions against 15 of their members saying, you guys knew that he was doing these deep dives. He was literally going down the rabbit hole. Hundreds of searches, prosecutors say, for classified information. Stuff he shouldn't have had access stuff, to. Stuff he should not have been looking at. He was not in a position of need to know. And that's what they targeted. And it sounds like something out of a spy movie, but frankly it is. And it's information that was not at all germane to the task that he was assigned to. He's doing it and then he puts it out there. You know, you look at that that big FBI presence when they were searching the home and when yeah. they went to make the arrest. You remember when that happened? It was like wall to wall. Wall to wall. And he had his gun safe two feet from his bed. Oof. If you look at his bedroom, it's set up. It looks like some sort of an army nest with camouflage. He's got uh, schematics for a car that he wanted to use as an, as an assassination car. This is somebody who had made a number of threats before. Serious questions as to why he was allowed into the military in the first place and now somebody who's part of frankly a long list of people over the past several years who have been uh, individuals who have been part of the Department of Defense who have been either part of the CIA who've been involved with sharing some of our crown jewels yeah. of our intelligence so when you put it together he obviously looked at the evidence and said 60 years versus 16 and change anybody can do that math mm -hmm. and so he decides to go for this guilty plea but I think it raises some troubling questions as far as the amount of material that just anybody has access to in the JWIC system, which is the computer system that he used to get this information. So um, it's certainly a day of reckoning, as you put it, and it'll be interesting to see if we see other types of cases like this as kind of this new generation, people that are used to going into deep dives in their early 20s get continued access to these types of systems. Tom Winter, thank you so much for that update on a story we've been following, as you know, for a long time. Appreciate exactly. it. You got it. Coming up here on the show, we're going to show you the first pictures of Kate Middleton this year after Buckingham Palace was forced to address speculation about her health. 
Plus, a potential new search for MH Flight 370. What officials in Malaysia are saying about the investigation in the plane that disappeared a decade ago. All of that's coming up in just a sec. Number one, new details in the murder of a pregnant Amish woman we told you about last week. Her husband found her body at their home in Pennsylvania, according to court documents, with police arresting a 52-year-old man in connection with the killing. No word yet on a possible motive. The, su the suspect has a prelim hearing in a couple of weeks. Number two, the Trump Organization's former CFO, Alan Weisselberg, pleading guilty to two counts of perjury today in connection with the testimony he gave during Mr. Trump's civil fraud trial. One source telling NBC News Weisselberg was not expected to enter into an agreement that would make him testify at any future trial. Sentencing is set for next month. You see him there. Number three, JetBlue and Spirit ending their nearly $4 billion merger weeks after a federal judge blocked the deal. The judge ruled the merger would affect customers relying on the low cost of Spirit. Now, JetBlue says both companies still believe in the deal, but they probably wouldn't meet some of the required conditions before the deadline in July. It means JetBlue is going to have to pay Spirit a nearly $70 million termination fee. Number four, Chick-fil-A wants people to throw out some Polynesian sauce packets if you bought them in the last month. It's because it might actually have a different sauce in it with some different allergens like wheat and soy. So if you enjoyed some Chick-fil-A at the store between the 14th and the 17th, heads up. But if you bought the big bottle, like the big Polynesian sauce bottle at the store, you apparently don't have to worry about it. All the Chick-fil-A news you can use right here on NBC News Now. Number five, the Denver Broncos say they're releasing quarterback Russell Wilson in order to build the strongest team possible. Wilson was with the team the past couple years with the head coach benching him late last season. Wilson responded to the announcement saying, Broncos country, thank you. I'm excited for what's next, but that is not even the biggest football headline of the day. The biggest, of course, is the announced retirement of Philadelphia Eagles icon Jason Kelsey with his emotional revelation today that he will leave the NFL after 13 unbelievable years with the Eagles. So a lot of people thanking Jason Kelsey tonight. We're also talking politics because we're just about, I don't know, half a day away maybe till polls open on Super Tuesday. First thing tomorrow morning, 630 Eastern, some of those polls start to open in at least one state. It's the biggest day of the calendar just in terms of sheer numbers. How many people are going to vote? Look at the map. Voters in 16 states plus American Samoa. And this year, this could also be maybe the official or unofficial start to the general election, at least a springboard for it. Here's our breakdown. It's the single biggest election day on the primary calendar, Super Tuesday. Voters representing states with more than 134 million people, nearly half the country. It can be the climax of the season when the competition thins out, like in 2020, when more moderates dropped out and backed Joe Biden on the Democratic side, launching him to the nomination. The drama, less intense this time. President Biden has no serious challenger, and there are just two left on the Republican side, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. For Haley, it may be make or break. We're going to keep going all the way through Super Tuesday. That's as far as I've thought in terms of going forward. We've that promise coming just hours before she lost her home state of South Carolina. She's lost seven states that have voted so far by about a two-thirds to one margin. Her only win? Washington, D.C., where just 2,000 people voted. Haley We're with our Kristen Welker about her expectations for Tuesday. That's always been the case in every step is can we continue to stay competitive? When 70 percent of Americans say they don't want Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you keep going to make sure people have a choice. Remember where things stand. Donald Trump has 247 delegates, Nikki Haley 43. And in some states, just getting some votes won't help her much. Five of these states award candidates all their delegates for the person who wins at least 50% of the vote, like Mr. Trump has done in every state so far. But technically, the Republican race won't be over after tomorrow night because even if Donald Trump has a gangbusters evening, he still can't hit the magic number to clinch the nomination, 1,215. That could come as early as next week. Of course, Nikki Haley pledging to stay in this race at least through tomorrow night. Still no firm answer on what she may decide to do after that. We will see. You will see right along with us tomorrow night in our special Super Tuesday coverage right here on NBC News Now. I'm joined by my friend and colleague Tom Yama starting at 5 o'clock Eastern. We're on till 10. Then it's NBC picking up with Lester and Savannah right then. Kristen Welker on the other side as well. we got a lot to get to, a lot coming up in the next 24 hours. And a lot more on this show, too, because when we come back, why thousands of doctors in South Korea may get their licenses suspended. Plus, the big first in France, how the country is now strengthening 
abortion rights. We're just learning that heavily armed gangs in Haiti have tried to take control of the main airport there, according to the Associated Press, as the U.S. Embassy in Haiti is telling all Americans to leave ASAP. The Haitian government declaring a state of emergency with a nighttime curfew going into place later on after armed gangs stormed two of the country's biggest prisons. It was a huge prison break, and that is what is driving so much of the chaos in Haiti right now. You're seeing some of the aftermath here with thousands of inmates escaping the prisons as part of those coordinated attacks. At least nine people have been killed, four of them police officers. It's part of this bigger push from these powerful gangs to try to get the prime minister to resign. I want to bring in Guad Venegas now. And Guad, let me start with the latest at the airport. I know this news is developing even as we speak. Do we know anything else about this apparent attack? Ellie, we know that uh, U.S. airlines are temporarily suspending service to Haiti, uh, but we don't have very many details. A lot of the news that is, uh, that is coming out of Haiti comes from the Associated Press. Because of the security situation, it's quite difficult to get information out of the country. So we know that these attacks that happened over the weekend um, were uh, allowed some of the gang leaders in uh, this prison to break out. Uh, most likely, they will join some of these gangs that are now, we understand, joining together uh, to attempt to topple the government. The security situation in Haiti has been worsening since the assassination of former President Jovenel Moïse. Uh, Ariel Henry, the prime minister, became the interim leader of the country. They haven't held elections since, and the gangs are now vowing uh, to topple this government. In fact, one of the gang leaders, Barbecue, says he will keep attacking until the prime minister... Uh, uh, until the prime minister uh, leaves power. Mm. Now, uh, one of the issues with Haiti is the lack of security forces. So the national police there has about 9,000 officers, but you're talking 9,000 officers for a country of 11 million people. They've been losing control. And as of now, uh, even before the violence that we've seen over the weekend, uh, Haiti had about 80% of its capital controlled by the gang. So it's going to be very difficult for the current security forces to take control once again, Hallie. Is it even possible? Well, the United Nations had a meeting a few uh, months ago to discuss how international help can come to Haiti, and they agreed that Kenya would send in a peacekeeping force. But then there's been issues in Kenya with its own government because the legislation, some people were against sending uh, these troops. So the prime minister, who's the interim leader of the country, left Haiti, and he's currently in Kenya trying to convince the leaders of that country to send the peacekeeping mission that would help regain control of the capital and parts of the country. Now, they would also do this with the support of the United Nations and financial support from countries like the United States. So that has been the solution that has been proposed. But we're still waiting to see if Kenya approves to send these uh, troops or this peacekeeping mission uh, into Haiti, Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you very much. Lots developing tonight in Haiti. Appreciate your coverage. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here is a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of France, a lot of celebrations there after Parliament's vote to make abortion a constitutional right. France now becomes the first country in the world to do this strengthening abortion rights in France. Polls there show more than 80% of the French support it. In South Korea, the government's making moves to suspend the medical licenses of thousands of junior doctors who have been striking for weeks. We've been covering it here on the show. Officials went to dozens of hospitals today to confirm the absences of these docs. Remember, nearly 9,000 medical interns and residents walked off their jobs, protesting a push by the government to boost the number of med students in order to meet higher demand. These striking doctors say schools can't handle that kind of increase and that more doctors would make medical care in that country more expensive. And out of Malaysia tonight, the government says it may start looking for missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 again after an American company proposed a new search at the alleged crash site. The flight and everybody on it disappeared not long after taking off in 2014. The Malaysian transportation minister said he listened to the company's search plan. If the evidence is credible, he'd try to get the government to sign a new contract to restart the search. That is one we are certainly watching. To Beijing now in a surprise move today, with China saying for the first time in 30 years, the country's premier will not speak with reporters after this yearly big national meeting. It's a big deal because this annual news conference is usually one of the very few opportunities for journalists to be able to question top Chinese leaders. 
It comes as the government has declared its commitment to transparency and to fostering a friendly business environment. While at the same time, President Xi Jinping is consolidating his power, pushing some other Chinese officials into less visible roles. Josh Letterman is joining us now. It's not as though China is considered a bastion of press transparency, right? But now even one of these rare opportunities to hold power to account is gone. That's right. And it's certainly sending the signal, Hallie, that China's uh, top leaders don't want to answer tough questions uh, from journalists, because this tradition has dated back to 1993. It was really the marquee event of the annual parliamentary uh, summit. And over the years, uh, you know, a lot of the questions were screened in advance, but there were opportunities to ask uh, the Chinese premier about things like human rights violations, about uh, challenges with the economy, which may be one of the reasons that China's leaders don't want to have uh, this news conference this year and in the coming years because uh, the Chinese economy uh, really has been suffering of late. Uh, a massive real estate crisis, diminishing foreign investment, as well as uh, economic growth rates that are really slowing. And so this will avert the need for China's leaders uh, to have to answer really specific questions about uh, the financial indicators, the, the state of their economy. Uh, but of course, it also really re reflects the fact that President Xi has consolidated power during his time. The premier, the number two role in the Chinese government is not nearly as powerful as it used to be. The other piece of this, too, is the way that, you know, we've talked about this before. Um, we've talked about it with our colleague Janice Mackey Ferrer as well. The idea of shifting sort of perspectives on Chinese social media, the idea that censors were regulating discussion of this change there. Um, how do you see that fitting into the bigger picture, Josh? Because, it, again, I think it's very different for American viewers, we, you know, who can largely get on social media platforms and, and share their opinions unfettered, so long as they don't infringe on others' rights. That's right. We're not used to doing a search on X, formerly Twitter or Facebook or anything else, and having it simply uh, not appear because the government doesn't want it to. But according to The New York Times, that's exactly what happened today on Chinese social media when people were searching for the phrasing of the statement that was put out announcing this news conference would not take place. It simply brought up an error message. And so it's a little bit ironic, given that this news conference in the past had been really one of the emblems of of China's claim that it is moving towards more transparency, towards a more democratic system, that it wants to be open to the rest of the world, especially uh, to business and foreign investment. And yet the mere fact that they're shutting down this news conference, they didn't really want people talking about on social media. And so we still uh, see the very clear uh, resistance that China's government has, especially under President Xi Jinping, to the type of transparency that is expected of most political systems around the world, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you very much for unpacking all of that for us tonight. Super interesting coming out of China. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, LeBron James and Drake betting big on the PGA Tour. Why their move may be more important than just the money involved. Coming up. So LeBron and Drake are coming to use their marketing power and, by the way, their powerful money to join a big push to help the PGA Tour fend off competition from Live Golf. Remember, Live is backed by the Saudis. This is according to new, new reporting from The New York Times. Uh, we've been covering this a bunch, right? The Live Tour, given literally hundreds of millions of dollars to the biggest names in golf. So now, most weekends when you flip on a PGA tournament, you may not see stars like Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson. Brooks Kepka, John Rahm. You can see there are some of the winningest players in golf. Brian Chung is joining us now. So what's interesting is that LeBron and, J and Drake, yep. LeBron, James, and Drake names. are joining us. They're strategic investors, they yeah. say. What does that mean? Because it means money, it means marketing, and it means trying to combat what Liv has, tr has tried to do here. Yeah, well, they certainly have money, right? But I think the bigger story with these two icons is just bringing the uh, power of their popularity to it as well. Because what we know is that there's a big, uh, basically, like, match, right, in terms of who can amass the most amount of money to bring in the big names in the golfing world itself. So Liv has a lot of Saudi money, sure, that's right? right. The PGA right. Tour needs to get their money as well. So yes, you have the money coming in from Drake and LeBron, but the idea here is to also use their names to bring popularity to the PGA Tour as well. LeBron has the connectedness to the global uh, sports world because of his uh, popularity as a ma massive NBA player. And Drake, obviously iconic in terms of the rapper scene, right? Money on my mind, mine on my money. He's got the money to be able to put it into it, but also he might be like courtside, right? He's popular yeah. for being on the side of those Toronto 
on a Raptor game, so maybe he can lend some of that popularity to the PGA Tour as well to bring in that demographic. But what does this mean for that huge merger news, right? The idea that for the PGA Live merger, how does this play into that? Yeah, well, pending merger, right? So well, that's right. right. That's so right. We don't know exactly how it's going to work out. There was a game plan and agreement between PGA and Live to merge that was supposed to be done by December 31st. They've been holding it off. We don't have an updated deadline as of now. So this is very interesting because okay, you're looking at this pending merger. They don't know how this is going to go. So PGA has to prepare as for the possibility as if it might not happen. So if that happens, how are you going to fund yourself, right? That's why they got money. They have a three billion dollar commitment from the strategic sports group. Maybe that's the rainy day fund, and part of this rainy day fund is also the celebrity of these two massive icons as well. So we'll see how that works out. What's interesting is what it sounds like what you're almost saying is like the idea being that LeBron Drake, this strategic investment fund, trying to compete with all that Saudi money that Liv has. Yeah, and that's going to be very important if the merger doesn't go through. Now, if the merger does go through, I guess they still have Drake and LeBron maybe showing up at the, you know, at, at the events. But at the end of the day, again, they have, they have to do a little bit of, uh, 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 I guess, planning, if you will, in case that doesn't end up uh, happening at all. Brian Chung, great to see you yeah, in likewise. person in New York here. Thanks for being here, friend. Yeah. Still to come, another potential game changer, this one for the world of college sports. How a union push at one Ivy League school could maybe spell the end of the NCAA as we know it. Oh yeah, more on that in just a sec. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And with March Madness coming up pretty quickly, we could see an election tomorrow that could change college sports forever. No, no, not Super Tuesday. This one up in New Hampshire, when the 15 members of Dartmouth College men's basketball team will vote to potentially, maybe, form the first ever union in college sports. Now, the results will stay hidden, so to speak, for a little bit while Dartmouth appeals, but it is a big shift. Right, if it happens, that could essentially end the NCAA as we know it. Here's Maura Barrett with more. Kate Haskins and Romeo Myrtle are like most students at Dartmouth. Every day is work and school, school and work. Except the work they do doesn't come with a paycheck. Why? Because they're on the men's basketball team. We don't get a stipend or any type of benefit for being athletes, even though we are, you know, working like full-time jobs basically by being on the team. The only way college athletes can get money for playing is through what's called name, image, and likeness. Basically, it lets players earn money for things like autographs, appearances, coaching, merch, video games, or endorsements, just not directly for what they do on the field. Some, like Southern California's Bronny James or LSU's Libby Dunn, can rack up big bucks, but those opportunities don't exist for every athlete. That's why Haskins and Myrtle decided to form a union to get compensated like other student employees with hourly wages similar to other student wages on campus or scholarships. Both players have had to take on what are essentially third jobs. Haskins has experience with unions, though, helping start one at the dining hall on campus. And we just saw the impacts and how influential their voices became um, once they actually became a union. There was a lot more power. Athletes have tried this before. So here we're seeking to form a labor union. Back in 2015, the National Labor Relations Board rejected Northwestern football's bid to form a union. But a decade later, a shift. Now, the NLRB is backing their bid, ruling the men's basketball team performs work in exchange for compensation in the form of gear, food, lodging, and tickets, since Ivy League athletes don't get scholarships. Dartmouth is appealing the ruling, telling NBC News unionization is not appropriate in this instance. The costs of Dartmouth's athletic program far exceed any revenue for the program. But Haskins and Myrtle already have their sights set on something bigger, overturning the whole system. At the core of all of this, it challenges the the term that we see so often in the conference of you guys being student athletes. What do you make of that term? Do you agree with it? I mean, no. It's a it's an old term, and it was used to kind of keep the the athletes as students first, and kind of de-emphasize the athlete part of it and the fact that they actually do work for the college. Sports law expert Michael McCann says these rulings could put the entire NCAA on notice. It's a game changer for college sports. So there would be a fundamental shift in the NCAA's model from a model where by rule these schools cannot pay the athletes and that makes them amateurs. College players are, have a big role in terms of generating revenue, uh, generating fundraising, generating admissions. So schools might rethink some of their numbers.
The NCAA has not responded to our request for comment, but it has a key factor working in its favor. Public schools like Alabama, Ohio State, and Michigan aren't covered by the NLRB, so there's no sign athletes at those schools could form unions yet. But more than a third of the D1 schools are private, leaving them wide open to take that step. For Haskins and Myrtle, they're now focusing on bringing together the whole Ivy League under one roof. We're not the only ones frustrated with the Ivy League and uh, with our own school. It, it's everybody. You know, everyone feels like we're being used in the Ivy League, and, and we want to make we want to change that. Laura is joining us now. You saw her there, obviously, in those interviews. More super interesting. There's also a bit of a political tie-in here too. Explain that. There's always a political tie-in, right, yeah. Hallie? If you didn't know, the president of the NCAA now is Charlie Baker, the same Charlie Baker who was the Republican governor of Massachusetts. He's a political player that's used to navigating big change in an institution, the NCAA, that's resistant to that kind of change. He was the Republican governor in a very liberal Massachusetts, so he's working on threading that needle to balance both sides. Now, what's more is that the president of the United States actually chooses the general counsel of the NLRB, and so we know that President Joe Biden is very uh, favorable to unions, but this could drag on until well past November, well past election season. Former President Trump hasn't taken a stance on this political particular issue, but that could make a difference in this ultimate de decision, depending on what we see in November, Hallie. Maura Barrett, uh, thank you very much for that reporting and for bringing us that story from Dartmouth. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.